Hey fellow lab rats, this is Rebecca from the Lab Rat YouTube channel. In this video, we're going to be discussing leukocytes. All right, let's get started. So leukopoiesis is the production of white blood cells, which are also called leukocytes. So this little drawing here on the right-hand side of the slide shows um, the different types of white blood cells uh, that we see normally in the peripheral bloodstream. So we have monocytes, eosinophils, basophils, lymphocytes, and neutrophils. Uh, white blood cells circulate uh, within the patient's peripheral blood, and then they move into the tissues to help to defend the body against foreign invaders like viruses or bacteria. Uh, white blood cell counts may increase when the body is fighting against infection or when there is inflammation. And some white blood cells uh, may also show morphological changes. And what that means is that cells don't always follow the textbook rules of how the, they look. Uh, we'll get more into that later on. Leukopoiesis starts with a multipotential hematopoietic stem cell. That stem cell then differentiates into two different and distinct progenitor cells, either CFUGEMM or CFUL. The CFUL becomes a lymphocyte, which is a type of white blood cell, and the CFUGEMM can become anything else. CFUGEMM is produced in the bone marrow, and CFUL is produced in the bone marrow and the lymphoid tissues. Recall that CFUL becomes a lymphocyte. So lymphocytes are leukocytes that originally uh, are made within the bone marrow, but then travel to lymphoid tissues to mature. So this is a flow chart showing the maturation lines of each cell type. So let me get out my pointer here. Let's use black today. Normally I use red for whatever reason. Um, so again, this is the flow chart uh, showing um, the maturation lines of each white blood cell type. So we started with a multi-potential hematopoietic stem cell up here. Um, and then it either becomes a myeloid progenitor cell or a lymphoid progenitor cell, okay? So if it is a lymphoid progenitor cell, so right here, Okay, so it becomes this lymphoid progenitor cell from that hematopoietic stem cell, okay? It becomes a lymphoblast here, okay? Um, and then a prolymphocyte, which is here, and then a mature lymphocyte. And we have B lymphocytes, T lymph lymphocytes, and then NK cells, which are natural killer cells. We'll talk briefly about those as well. Um, but that is the lymphoid uh, maturation uh, cycle. Now, when we go to the left-hand side of this uh, flow chart, which is here, right? So we have the hematopoietic stem cell, and then it differentiates and becomes a myeloid progenitor cell. It can basically become anything else. So it first becomes a myeloblast, all right? Now don't freak out about this. We're gonna talk about this in detail, okay? I'm just giving you a rundown before we talk about these each individually. So. Once it becomes a myeloblast, depending on whether or not it's gonna be a basophil, a neutrophil, an eosinophil, or a monocyte, okay? So that myeloblast is gonna become one of those things, all right? Um, then, in white blood cells, of course, um, it, will, it will continue down this side of the flow chart depending on what it's going to be, right? So um, again, um, the monocyte, all right? So let's say it's, it's becoming a monocyte. So it goes from myeloblast to monocyte. It becomes a monoblast, promonocyte, and then a monocyte, right? Um, the neutrophil, eosinophil, and basophils, all right? So basophil, neutrophil, and eosinophil, all right? Those are actually called granulocytes, which we'll talk about that here momentarily. Um, these mature from blast, pro, milo, meta, and band stages before they become um, mature cells. Now, you do not have to differentiate between the pro, milo, meta, and band stages of basophils and eosinophils, but you do need to be able to determine, uh, be able to differentiate those morphologically under a microscope between all those stages in the neutrophil cell line, which is here, okay? So basically what I'm saying is um, when you are looking at a blood cell differential, which again, we'll talk more about this in the future here, you have to identify 
this cell, this cell, this cell, this cell, this cell, and this cell, of course, in that neutrophil cell line if you see it within the peripheral blood. Now, let's say you see the metamyelocyte version of the eosinophil, right? You don't have to call it a, a metamyelocyte eosinophil. You just call it an eosinophil. So if you see any of these here, you're going to just call it an eosinophil. I'll win this too, sorry. Same with the basophil. All of these, we're just going to call them basophils if we see it in the peripheral blood. Um, so again, neutrophils, this cell line, you need to be able to differentiate between all of those cells, promyelocytes, myelocytes, metamyelocytes, bands, and neutrophils. And again, we'll talk about that in great de detail uh, later on in this presentation. In hematology, a complete blood count with differential includes parameters such as red blood cell count, white blood cell count, and platelet count. It also contains a blood cell differential. So this is how many out of each kind of white blood cell that is present within the patient's blood. So all of these tests are performed on an automated hematology analyzer on an EDTA tube. So this is going to be a lavender purple top tube. If the analyzer detects an issue or abnormality with the blood cell differential, it will notify the laboratory professional and they must make a peripheral blood smear of the patient, stain that peripheral blood smear, and then do a manual differential under the microscope. Now there are two different counts that are uh, related to blood cell differentials. So these are the relative count and the absolute count. The relative count is a minimum of 100 white blood cells counted and differentiated on a blood smear and given as a percent out of 100. So for example, a manual differential was performed and 100 white blood cells were counted and differentiated by the laboratory professional. So on this uh, example, there were 94 neutrophils seen out of 100, four lymphocytes seen out of 100, and one monocyte seen out of, of course, 100. So 94% are neutrophils, 4% are lymphocytes, and 1% are monocytes. So these are their relative counts. Now the absolute count takes into account the patient's total white blood cell count. It's calculated by multiplying the patient's white blood cell count by the total white blood cell count of each kind. So in this case, the patient had a total white blood cell uh, count of 15 times 10 to the ninth per liter. So you would take 0.94 and multiply it by 15, which gives you 14.1 for neutrophils, and that 0.94 is coming from that 94% on the relative count. So you'd have 14.1 for neutrophils. For lymphocytes, you take 0.04 and multiply it by 15, and that 0.04 is coming because um, the relative count counted four lymphocytes. So you move the decimal point, point over to get rid of the percentage. And, and that gives you 0 0.6. And for monocytes, you would take 0 0.01 and multiply it by 15, which gives you 0 0.15. So these numbers that we just calculated are their absolute counts. And physician uses um, the relative counts and the absolute counts. So luckily, uh, you won't have to calculate absolute counts in the field. Um, the computer system calculates it for you. Um, but for the purpose of this course and also for your board of certification examination, if you're an MLT or an MLS student, you do need to know the difference between the two counts and how to calculate the absolute counts. Um, so go ahead and check out uh, one of my videos. Um, I will link it uh, below in the description and also in the comments section. Um, I do work out some relative and absolute counts um, uh, for you. So the normal reference range for white blood cells in adults is 4 to 11 times 10 to the 9th per liter. For relative counts, the reference ranges for each white blood cell types are as follows. And yes, I'm sorry, you do need to know these. <laughs> uh, neutrophils are 50 to 70 percent for their relative count. Lymphocytes, 25 to 40 percent. Monocytes, 4 to 10 percent. Eosinophils, 1 to 3 percent. And basophils, 0 to 1 percent. Again, these are the relative count reference ranges. So this would be if a uh, laboratory professional counted 100 cell differential, um, this would be the, the number of neutrophils or lymphocytes, monocytes out of 100 that that uh, lab professional counted. 
Now for the absolute counts, the normal reference range uh, for white blood cells is as follows. So neutrophils 2 to 7 times 10 to the third per microliter, lymphocytes 1.5 to 4 times 10 to the third per microliter, uh, monocytes 0 0.2 to 0 0.8 times 10 to the third per microliter, eosinophils less than 0.45 times 10 to the third per microliter, and then basophils are less than 0.2 times 10 to the third per microliter. Normal children have a higher total white blood cell count at birth when compared to adults. So their white blood cell uh, reference range is 9 to 30 times 10 to the ninth per liter. So within a week after birth, the white blood cell normal reference range drops to around 5 to 21 times 10 to the ninth per liter. The white blood cell counts uh, gradually declines until the child is around 8 years of age. And then it reaches that normal adult reference range, which is 4 to 11 times 10 to the ninth per liter. So now younger children have a higher lymph count, both in relative and absolute counts, um, and then a lower granulocyte count as well in comparison to adults. And granulocytes are those white blood cells that have granules within their cytoplasm. So these are neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. At around age four, the granulocyte levels gradually increase to adult levels, reaching that at around six years of age. So now that we know the reference ranges for leukocytes, we also need to learn terms associated with an increase and decrease of these cells. Um, so an increase of white blood cells is called leukocytosis, whereas a decrease is called leukopenia. For neutrophils, an increase is called neutrophilia, and a decrease is called neutropenia. For lymphocytes, an increase is called lymphocytosis, and a decrease is called lymphopenia. An increase of monocytes is called monocytosis. Uh, the reference range for monos is so low uh, that there isn't a term used for decrease of monocytes. The same goes for eosinophils and basophils. An increase of eosinophils and basophils are called eosinophilia and basophilia, respectively. The primary function of white blood cells or leukocytes is to protect the body from infectious agents and pathogens. A pathogen enters the body and is recognized as foreign. Cells attack, engulf, and kill that pathogen. Neutrophils and monocytes play a major role in the body's innate immune response, uh, but their functions are limited. Now, the adaptive immune response is initiated in the lymphoid tissue. Lymphocytes recognize the pathogen and become activated to attack. Now, um, immunology is a required course in MLT and MLS programs, um, and you will learn about this in immuno, uh, so I'm not going to talk too uh, in depth about this. Um, if you have any questions specifically related to immunology, you know, feel free to leave them down in the comments. I'll be happy to answer them if you're confused about any of this, these types of of immune responses. Now granulocytes are neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Let me get my pointer here. I'm going to use red this time. All right, so this is a segmented neutrophil here. This is an eosinophil, and this is a basophil. All right, so these are granulocytes, and they're called granulocytes because hopefully you can guess this. They have granules within their cytoplasm. So these white blood cells are found in four locations, uh, in the bone marrow, in the peripheral blood circulating pool, in the peripheral blood's marginating pool, and then also within the tissues. In the bone marrow, there is a proliferation pool. Uh, this is the mitotic pool where the cells are proliferating. Uh, the maturation pool is where cells are held to develop and age. And then in the storage pool, the cells are held until they are needed to be released into the peripheral bloodstream. So on the previous slide, we said that the granulocytes are uh, in the peripheral blood, in the circulating pool, and in the marginating pool. Um, so uh, the circulating pool contains the blood that we draw from a venipuncture. It's located towards the center of the tubular blood vessel and contains functioning cells in the circulation on their way to the tissues. The marginating pool is a term that is primarily used for white blood cells. So the cells are adhered to the walls of blood vessels and are ready to move through into the tissues when needed. There's a constant flow between the circulating and the marginating pools. The concentration of cells is 50% in the circulating pool and 50% in the marginating 
Cool. And the next slide um, gives you, I'll give you an example of kind of a picture example of this. All right, so here's this picture example here. Um, it gives you an idea about the location of each pool. So this here is kind of a picture representation of the inside of a blood vessel. Um, so the circulating pool here is where um, in a venipuncture collection it's going to be taking blood from. So the needle punctures into the blood vessel and there's like we'll just say that's the bevel here. It's really hard to uh, draw on <laughs> PowerPoint, but that's the bevel there. So the needle goes in through, um, punctures into the blood vessel and goes and sucks up the blood that is in the circulating pool. Um, now on the outside walls of the blood vessels, so this red portion here, right, is the marginating pool and that's where some of the white blood cells hang out and um, are uh, adhere to those blood vessel walls in case there is uh, a foreign invader. And so that way they can easily go from that marginating pool into uh, the tissues um, to um, attack those foreign invaders. Recall that the bone marrow has a proliferating pool, a maturation pool, and a storage pool. The proliferating pool is where proliferation happens. Um, so this means when cells, uh, cells are dividing uh, via mitosis, usually undergoing four to five total cell divisions um, over a three to six day period. In this pool are the myeloblasts, promyelocytes, and myelocytes. This picture on the right uh, hand side is a great uh, example of showing these cells. Um, so this one here is a blast, this one is a promyelocyte, and this one is a myelocyte. Uh, once we talk about these particular cells throughout this lecture, feel free to return to this slide and take a look at them. In the maturation pool in the bone marrow, the cells are no longer capable of mitosis. So this means they're not actively dividing. Uh, they are not fully mature yet as well. So these include metamyelocytes and bands. So this here is a metamyelocyte and this is a band or a banded neutrophil. Um, so once uh, we talk about these particular cells throughout this lecture, uh, feel free to return to the slide and take a look at these cells. Now the storage pool is where cells are held until simulated for release from the bone marrow um, into the peripheral blood. So these are fully mature and when released migrate to the marginating and circulating pools in the peripheral bloodstream. So these cells are bands and segmented, also called SEGs. Uh, so this is a band and this is a segmented, right? Uh, so again, once we talk about these particular cells, uh, feel free to return to the slide and take a look at them. So this slide is super awesome and super important. Recall at the beginning of this lecture, there was sort of like a flow chart showing the maturation lines of each cell type. So we started with a multipotential hematopoietic stem cell, and it either becomes a myeloid progenitor cell or a lymphoid progenitor cell. If it's a lymphoid progenitor cell, it becomes a lymphoblast, then a prolymphocyte, and then a mature lymphocyte. If it's a myeloid progenitor cell, it basically can become any other cell. Uh, so it differentiates into either a neutrophil, basophil, eosinophil, or a monocyte. The monocyte goes from a monoblast to a promonocyte to a monocyte. The neutrophil, eosinophil, and basophils mature in pro, myelo, meta, and band stages before they become those mature cells. Now you do not uh, need to differentiate between the pro, myelo, meta, and band stages of basos and eos. And just as an FYI, um, med lab professionals abbreviate basically everything. So basos is a short abbreviation for basophils and eos are referring to eosinophils. Uh, now, so you don't need to, to differentiate those stages. If you see a basophil in any of those stages, it's a basophil. If you see an eosinophil in any of those stages, it's an eosinophil. Now, you do need to know and be able to uh, recognize all the precursor phases for neutrophils, and they're listed here in this great little chart. Uh, on the far left-hand side here, we have a blast. Let me get out my pointer here. This is a blast. Now, technically, this is a myeloblast because it's going to become a neutrophil, but we don't know that looking at it in the peripheral blood. 
In the peripheral blood, we see this, we're just gonna call it a blast, okay? So then we have, this next cell is a promyelocyte, then we have a myelocyte, then we have a metamyelocyte, then we have a banded neutrophil or a band, and then we have a segmented neutrophil or a seg, all right? So in hematology, you will hear the term left shift pretty frequently. This picture chart shows a great way to explain what this means. So the segmented neutrophil is normal to see in the peripheral blood. So we're talking about this one here, all right? Um, and uh, when you start seeing premature precursors to the segmented neutrophil, like bands and metas and mylos, we call that a left shift because it's shifting to the left. All right. Now, I have created a video, a separate video, talking in detail about what a left shift is, and I highly recommend you checking out that video. I will go ahead and link it in the description of this video. Alrighty, so here is the first morphologically identifiable cell, the myeloblast. And I cannot repeat this enough. You cannot tell that this is a myeloblast just by looking at it. So when I'm talking about this cell right here, okay, you cannot tell. If you saw this cell, you would just say it's a blast. You can't tell if it's a myelo, a myeloblast. You can't tell if it's erythroblast. You can't tell if it's a monoblast. You can't tell if it's a lymphoblast. If you're just looking at it, now, of course, I'm talking to uh, medical laboratory science students and medical laboratory technologist students, right? You would see this and say it's a blast, okay? Um, now, um, the only... Uh, the only way that you could identify it uh, as a myeloblast is if it has something called an hour rod. And I realize I didn't write this in here, but I will write it here. Hour rod. And we'll talk about this later on uh, in hematology, but I just want to give you an idea. So if you see this little inclusion here in this blast cell, um, so these are um, created from the fusion of granules, and these are only present in myeloblasts. So if you see our rods, you want to note it um, in, in the patient's differential, um, and these would be uh, classified as myeloblasts, but not all myeloblasts have our rods, okay? Um, so you would just want to say blasts and then our rods present. Right. So that is the only stipulation of why you would be able to identify it as a myeloblast. Um, but you cannot determine just by looking at it without that without that hour rod whether or not it's a myeloblast or a lymphoblast. What would have to happen in this particular case is if a patient did have blast, they have something done called flow cytometry, which actually identifies um, these different cells based on their CD markers, and that determines whether what you know what lineage is if it's a myeloblast or a lymphoblast. Hopefully that, uh, that makes sense. So let's just get back to these blasts, all right? Uh, so these myeloblasts, so these are large cells with a round to oval nucleus. Uh, their nucleus to cytoplasm ratio is around four to one. So what that means is there's not a lot of cytoplasm, there's a lot of nucleus, all right? So when we're looking at this cell here, let's use red. This large purple thing here is the nucleus and all the blue stuff on the outside is the cytoplasm, okay? So you can see there's a lot more nucleus than there is cytoplasm, and this is very characteristic of a uh, blast. So um, they have prominent uh, nucleoli um, and basophilic cytoplasm. So what in the heck does that mean? All right, so if you can see in these pictures, if you can see just a faint circle here, right? You see that? That's the nucleoli. All right, or nucleoli, however you want to pronounce it. Um, so those are present in blasts. So if you look on, let me actually erase this so you can see the indent. You see how that is there? Now let's go to this right-hand side one. There's a nucleoli there. There's another one here. So this is very common in blast cells. They'll have this very prominent. It would let me uh, erase those so you can actually see it without those without that laser pointer there. Okay, so those are very common to see in, in blasts. And I also said basophilic cytoplasm. So that means the cytoplasm is gonna have a dark uh, blue color to it. So now these cells are not normal to see in the peripheral blood. And if you see one, it's a problem. 
and it needs to be evaluated by a pathologist. Now, your job as a laboratory professional is to recognize the cell and say, hey, this person has blasts in their blood, this isn't normal, and give it to the pathologist. If it's a previously uh, un, uh, undiagnosed patient, they will likely need a bone marrow biopsy and flow cytometry to figure out what lineage the blast is. But basically, in short, blasts are bad, and this is a malignant or a cancerous process. The next cell in the maturation process is called a promyelocyte. Um, because we abbreviate basically everything in the laboratory, we actually call these pros. So this is actually a really beautiful cell. They are large as well um, and have a round oval nucleus. So again, let's see here. This purple thing here is the nucleus and all of this here is the cytoplasm, all right? Uh, so their nucleus to cytoplasm ratio is three to one. Uh, they can have nucleoli or nucleoli. Um, so in this particular cell, this right here is, is that. And let me erase all this so you can see it without the laser pointer there. There we go. So that particular, this particular cell has one of those. Um, and they also have a basophilic cytoplasm. And what I mean by that is they have a dark blue cytoplasm. Um, they have large granules present in them, um, as you can see in this picture on the right hand slide. So I'm talking about these, these granules here. Kind of hard to see on that picture, um, but most of them have a, a really, um, really prominent um, granules in them. Um, and um, again, um, this is kind of like blasts. These are not normal to see in the uh, peripheral blood. Um, and honestly, they're actually reasonably rare to see uh, while performing differentials if you're just like in a regular hospitori a hos hospital laboratory. The next cell in the maturation process is called a myelocyte, or abbreviated as a myelo. They have a round oval nucleus and may have a flattened side. The nucleus to cytoplasm ratio is three to one. And as you can see in this photo of a myelo on the right hand side, the cytoplasm of the cell is starting to look like the color of a normal mature neutrophil. It kind of has like a pinkish hue to it. Um, there can also be granules present, although not always. Um, and these are not normal to see in the peripheral blood. Um, if they're seen, it's called a left shift. So if you notice in these cells, uh, re remember um, when I was talking about erythrocytes, so um, baby cells are larger in size and as they mature, they start getting smaller. So look at this cell in comparison to the red blood cell, right? It's bigger than the red blood cell, but it's certainly not as big as a blast or a promyelo. So it's, this cell is starting to condense. It's getting more cytoplasm, less nucleus, and the cell overall is just getting smaller. The metamyelocyte or meta is the next cell in the maturation process of a uh, neutrophil. The nucleus of a meta is indented less than 50% of the width of a hypothetical round nucleus. The nucleus to cytoplasm ratio is 1.5 to 1. So again, that the nucleus is getting smaller. Uh, the cytoplasm is going to be predominant. Um, they can have granules. Um, and as you can see in this picture here, the cytoplasm is really starting to look like a mature neutrophil here. Now, the characteristic feature of this cell is, is the nucleus. And how I differentiate these from myelocytes and bands is just by that nucleus. Uh, same color pinkish looking cytoplasm, um, but the nucleus is distinct. And I actually call these butt cheek cells. Uh, so metas look like a person has sat in purple paint and then sat right down on the cell, forming a butt cheek print in the cell. So it's kind of a crass way of explaining it, but it really does look like that and will help you in differentiating them from milos and bands. And again, these are not normal to see in the peripheral blood. And if they are seen, it's called a left shift. So you can see here. So this is the nucleus of the meta. And this is the nucleus of the meta. All right, this is actually an eosinophil down here, but you can hardly tell. We'll talk about eos in a little bit. But as you can see, this cytoplasm here is starting to look like a normal neutrophil. Um, and this indented nucleus just kind of looks like a, a butt <laughs> that's been sat down in wet paint, wet purple paint, and sat on that cell. Uh, hopefully that'll help you uh, be able to distinguish them. The next cell is called a banded neutrophil or band. You can see how the nucleus is further indenting from that metamyelocyte. 
So it no longer looks like that butt cheek, right? It's like much more indented. Uh, there must be this definitive C shape to the nucleus. So you can see it's a, it's a very distinct C shaped uh, nucleus. Um, and uh, so you have to have that C shape in order to call it a band. Now the cytoplasm predominates and you can see the cytoplasm color is that of a segmented neutrophil. These account for about zero to 5% of all neutrophils seen in the peripheral blood. So a small amount seen in the peripheral blood is normal. Uh, again, less than 5%. The mature form of the neutrophil is the segmented neutrophil or SEG. Uh, these are also called polymorphonuclear neutrophils or PMNs. Uh, they're most commonly called PMNs when discussing them in microbiology. In hematology, we just call them SEGs. Uh, they have a two to five lobe nucleus that is connected by thin filaments. If there are more than five lobes to the nucleus, it's called a hypersegmented uh, neutrophil or hypersegmentation. Um, so in this cell, the cytoplasm predominant, predominates, and these account for around 50 to 70% of all the white blood cells in the peripheral bloodstream. There's this cool thing that happens with segmented neutrophils, and the photo on the right-hand side of this slide shows a bar body, so that little pink arrow. It's this little protrusion on the nucleus of a segmented nucleus. Um, in genetic females, those with XX chromosomes, uh, the X that is inactivated shows up as this bar body on segmented neutrophil. Uh, so this also occurs in genetic males that have something called Klinefelter syndrome, and this syndrome is a genetic condition that gives genetic males an extra copy of the X chromosome. Um, so this bar body isn't important really. You don't need to call it in a differential that you saw them or anything like that. It's just something that does appear on neutrophils in genetic female patients. Eosinophils or EOs are granulocytes, meaning they have granules within their cytoplasm. And what's characteristic about them is that they have these huge abundant red to orange granules in their cytoplasm. It's actually some of my favorite white blood cells. I think they're absolutely gorgeous. The cytoplasm predominates in these cells, and they usually account for around 1 to 3 percent of all leukocytes or white blood cells within the peripheral bloodstream. Um, so you can see these are just really, really pretty cells. Look how gorgeous this cytoplasm is. And you can see it's hard to tell in this top picture here, but on this bottom picture, you can see there's actually like, look at these large granules in them. So these large orange, pinkish, reddish granules all throughout that cytoplasm. I think these are really, really cool looking. Now patients that have an increased number of eosinophils have something called eosinophilia, and it's associated with um, allergies, parasitic infections, uh, toxic reactions, and respiratory tract disorders. And here's the basophil. So this is also a granulocyte, so uh, that meaning it has granules in the cytoplasm. So think about it right now, what, which of the white blood cells are granulocytes? We have the basophil, the eosinophil, do you remember the other one? It's the neutrophil. So neutrophil, basophil, and eosinophils are referred to as granulocytes. So basophils do have a two-lobe nucleus, uh, but oftentimes you can't see the nucleus because the cell is so covered with these dark purple to black granules. Uh, basophils should only account for 0 to 1% of the total amount of white blood cells present in the peripheral bloodstream. Alrighty. So um, here is the monocyte. So these have a very variable nucleus, meaning it doesn't look the same all the time at all. It can be round or kidney shaped. They're just variable. Uh, the cytoplasm is blue gray in color and um, it, they may have pseudopods, which are projections of the cytoplasm. Uh, remember these cells like to phagocytize or eat up foreign invaders. Uh, they may have vacuoles, as you can see in this mod on the right-hand side of the slide. So let me get out my pointer here. So these are little vacuoles in the cell. So this is very common in monocytes, but just because you see vacuoles does not mean automatically that it is a monocyte. Uh, monocytes do have them. They don't always have them. And sometimes, depending on um, morphological changes, um, some other cells may have vacuoles as well. So if you see a vacuole, it's not automatically a monocyte. If you notice here on this cell too, um, a lot of students just starting out and doing differentials get these uh, mixed up with lymphocytes. 
Um, traditionally, and again, cells don't follow the textbook rules, so it's not, you know, it's not a definitive thing, but traditionally, usually, monocytes are going to be uh, bigger than lymphocytes. Look at them in comparison to the red blood cells, so they're, they're substantially bigger. Um, this cytoplasm is usually a little bit lighter and, like, lacier than a lymphocyte, um, but uh, traditionally, this is what a uh, monocyte is going to look like. Monocytes act on foreign invaders by phagocytizing them or eating them. They are called monocytes in the peripheral bloodstream. When they enter the tissues, they are called macrophages or macrophages. Uh, these still phagocytize dead cells, viruses, and bacteria, but just do it a little slower than monocytes in the blood. All right, now the next white blood cell we're going to be talking about are lymphocytes or lymphs, and these help to regulate the body's immune response. They're present in secondary lymphatic tissues and are the second most prevalent leukocyte in the bloodstream, accounting for around 20 to 40 percent of the total number of white blood cells in the peripheral blood. In children less than four years of age, lymphocytes are the highest number of white blood cells present. They have a scant moderate sky blue cytoplasm and have a round to oval nucleus. This lymph on the right hand side of the slide is very normal uh, looking mature lymphocytes. Um, and if you notice here, look how large or rather small this cell is in comparison to the red blood cells. A lot of times uh, new students in this field get these confused with blast cells, right? And they do look similar, don't get me wrong, I get it. Um, I understand that confusion. But one of the key things here is the size. So a blast cell is going to be much bigger than a red blood cell and a lymphocyte for the most part is usually going to be smaller. So baby lymphocytes are called uh, lymphoblasts. And again, recall, we cannot distinguish between a lymphoblast or a myeloblast, erythroblast, all those things, unless we have something called flow cytometry, unless there's an outrod. Now, if there's an outrod present in the cytoplasm, it is going to be uh, distinguished as a myeloblast. But, uh, so blast, uh, lymphoblasts are baby lymphocytes. Um, so if we see these in the peripheral bloodstream, we're just going to call them blasts. Um, so now we should not see these in the bloodstream, and if we do, a pathologist must get involved because it indicates a malignant uh, or a cancerous process. Now lymphocytes are probably the hardest white blood cell for students to differentiate um, and also as new, uh, new medical laboratory professionals. They're an integral part of the immune system and respond to their environment. And because of this, they are very active and um, also very variable in how they appear. So all of, um, uh, so this, uh, this lymphocyte is um, a very um, normal looking mature lymphocyte has a little bit of cytoplasm, predominantly nucleus, um, but this is again just a very mature, normal looking uh, lymph. So they can look variable. Let's look at the next slide here. So all of these cells here are lymphocytes, all right, and you can see how they're a little bit variable. Sometimes the cytoplasm is a little bit larger, sometimes the overall cell is bigger uh, than a normal uh, looking mature lymph, um, but they are, there is some variability. Now, reactive lymphocytes are the result of lymphs just doing their jobs. They're constantly working and it can appear slightly differently than a normal mature looking lymph in the bloodstream. They may have a basophilic colored rim on the nucleus. So this is um, like kind of a dark or blue color on the rim of the nucleus. Uh, the cytoplasm can turn a bit darker and they can also swarm around blood cells if they are adjacent to them in the blood smear. Now here's a picture of a reactive lymphocyte, um, and we'll talk more about these and practice identifying the variability of lymphocytes in our laboratory sessions. It's common to get these confused with blasts and monocytes, and that's okay. Uh, we'll work uh, towards uh, being able to properly identify these. Um, so this reactive lymph um, on this slide is kind of swarming around the red blood cell, so you can see it here kind of swarming, and there's a little bit of an increased basophilic uh, rim around the cytoplasm. Um, so this is a classic reactive lymph. Um, I could not find any really, really good um, non-copyright images uh, for this particular presentation of reactive lymphs, um, but I encourage you to just Google reactive lymphocytes, um, and you can see a ton of pictures there of, of reactive lymphs. 
Now, the last slide of this presentation, we're going to talk about plasma cells. And plasma cells are differentiated B lymphocytes. Now, these are not normal to see in the peripheral blood. And if they are seen, a pathologist should get involved with the patient's care. They have a round oval nucleus, which is often eccentric, meaning it's pushed to one side of the cell. And they usually have a, deep, a deeply basophilic cytoplasm, so a, a, a dark blue cytoplasm. And characteristically, they have a paranuclear halo, which can be seen in the cells on the right-hand side of this slide. Um, so you see here, let me get my little laser here, you see how there's like this white and clearing, this paranuclear halo around the nucleus? It's subtle, but it's there. See how that is? So that's very classic of a plasma cell. So um, also another thing to look here is the eccentric nucleus. So you see how the nucleus is just pushed to, let's, let's look at the cell here. So that's the cytoplasm here. Here's the nucleus. You see how it's just kind of pushed off to one side. It's not really in the middle of the cell. Um, that's, again, uh, another classic uh, plasma cell characteristic. All right, so that concludes this lecture on leukocytes. Um, if you uh, appreciated this video, go ahead and give it a like. And um, as always, if you have any questions about this lecture or have any suggestions, on uh, topics that I should cover in the med lab profession, uh, please leave your comments below. All right, until next time.